After two months of circuit breaker restrictions, Singapore is returning to some form of normality as more services and activities resumed under phase two. And yet, the fight against COVID-19 is hardly over. My name is Diana Sir. Welcome to this first of three special episodes of In Conversation. In this series, we ask the question, what is the way forward for Singapore as we all learn to live with the coronavirus? With me today is Minister for Law and Home Affairs, K. Shambhugam. Welcome, Minister. Thank you. We're all very excited to be in phase two. Phase two is aimed at restarting the economy. Now, as we move into this phase and beyond, how do we balance public safety and economic activity? We have to be careful. We have to protect lives. People want their safety. At the same time, we have to protect livelihoods too. People need their jobs. So you've got to balance. And uh, we've been you know, holding back the circuit breaker, if you recall, as in terms of you know, not imposing it and allowing normal life to go on more than other countries. We imposed it later. Then uh, we looked at it in April, May, and uh, if you look at June, for example, uh, first week of June, we had an average about 10 cases in the community. Uh, second week of June, it came down to about seven to eight cases. The third week of June, it's come down to about four cases. That gave us the confidence to move to phase two. Now, the experience of other countries is that uh, when you have greater interaction, greater communication, the risks of transmission also increase, you know, common sense. So does that mean we don't go into phase two, we don't start phase two, now we've been in phase two for a few days? That's not possible. The key thing is to tell people that if we take sufficient measures, and if each one of us treats ourselves as a front line in this fight, and that each one of us bears individual responsibility and we all collectively understand the risks and work in that context, we can have a successful phase two and move towards phase three, which is what I hope, I'm sure everyone hopes, but uh, we need to be very careful. And in this phase, we need to be extremely careful to protect the vulnerable segments, people in the nursing homes, people in the hospitals, the senior citizens. They need to be kept really safe the rest of us, you know, we go, of course, there is some risk of transmission, but if we take adequate precautions, we should be okay. You've mentioned the infection rates. Uh, are the infection numbers the only markers that the government is looking out for when deciding how and when to open up? You've got to look at a variety of factors. Infection rates tells you the kind of uh, situation there is in the community, but you also look at the signs from around the world you look to see what kind of measures can we put in so that people can try and go about their lives as far as possible while uh, you know, we minimize the risks. Ultimately, the key factor is you've got to make sure your uh, senior citizen population is uh, safeguarded. They are kept safe because when they fall sick with COVID-19, the mortality rate is higher. So you want to save their lives. Younger people can take it a little bit better, but that doesn't mean you expose them. But you know they have to go about their lives, but you've got to tell them how to go about it. And that requires uh, internalization of individual responsibility. So it's not a question of, oh, the government puts this rule down and I've got to obey, now how can I get around it? Or you know what can I do which comes to the line? No, it is really, how can I help in this fight? We've got to make sure the healthcare system is always ahead of the curve. That means the capacity there is higher than the number of people infected. And at the same time, keep the infection as few as possible and save your vulnerable groups and have uh, you know, decent economic activity. Have people go about their lives. Otherwise, mental health also suffers. People get cooped up. So it's many different factors to juggle. And all of them, when they interact, they're very dynamic. Yes, absolutely. It, you mentioned healthcare, and uh, when it re reopens, when I look at other countries, obviously things like contact tracing and things like testing comes into play as well. Uh, how prepared are we as far as those aspects are concerned? We are quite prepared. Uh, we've focused on contact tracing right from the beginning, but we've had to make sure that it becomes more tech-based. And then you, uh, and you know, trace together app needs to be downloaded. 
people need to understand the importance of it so that you know it can tell you if in, you get infected you know we can quickly identify who else has come into contact with you and who needs to be saved so it's for the safety of society we are also thinking in terms of a wearable that will tell you you know where you're going and uh, in terms of uh, who you have been in contact with should the need arise if there is an infection contact tracing is critical and uh, being able to identify and close down clusters is critical we have seen it in the countries you know south korea china other places when you open up clusters will form um, you've spoken about the dongle the wearable device uh, did it surprise you when there was an online petition calling for more transparency and, and generally they were worried about uh, privacy issues did that surprise you uh, yes and no i can imagine and i can understand people ordinary people intelligent people being genuinely uh, questioning they want to know what this is about you know how much of their privacy is going to be invaded so that's fair but you also had a segment uh, which didn't surprise me which uh, tried to politicize the issue and jump on it and try and create all sorts of untruths and falsehoods about it as to what it can and cannot do for example so that's uh, sad but you know it happens in every society for those who are genuinely worried what would you say to them that the data resides in the device and it's only accessed if there is a question of infection you talked about lives as well as livelihoods there are very many people out there who are really still afraid of the virus yes. and they think that we should not reopen therefore they think the government is focusing too much on livelihoods at the moment what would you say to them i will say i understand their concerns there are many people who would prefer to be in a lockdown mode or circuit breaker strict circuit breaker mode for a further period but there are a equal number if not a larger number who really want to move on and say look we can take some limited risks you've got to balance the two and it's got to be guided by our understanding of the science so when you have about four community cases per day uh, on average and uh, you roughly you know uh, contained it you know that you have contained it then you can have these safety measures safe distancing measures and allow life to return slowly back to normal it's a difficult balance under the best of circumstances uh, and i think uh, what people do what most people don't realize is that when you have a very poor economy it also impacts on our health our health our mental health being cooped up and uh, when people's livelihoods are destroyed it's very difficult to come back and uh, businesses go away um, they migrate away and uh, people you know our position as an international hub means jobs for our people once those jobs go away it's not easy to get them back if you protect lives you don't take you know uh, unnecessary risks you need to put in the framework the rules but you also need to be sensible about how you open up Um let's talk about something that I believe is very close to your heart. Uh under the COVID-19 temporary measures, it also includes protection against contractual obligations as well as rental waiver. Should the economy not uh turn around significantly in the next few months, is the government prepared uh, to help more and for a greater period of time? First, why did we intervene in a way we've never intervened before? It's a crisis unparalleled both in our history and in many ways since the second world war in the rest of the world too it's huge it's affected our economic sector tremendously now economic sector is not some sort of you know other world economic sector means jobs of singaporeans livelihoods of people and so the government has done something that no one would have thought our government would do you know spend a huge amount of money because this is what we have always said we save for a rainy day and this is a huge rain it's a tornado and this is when you have to spend and we have said we will do everything it takes to keep the economy going which means our livelihoods our people's livelihoods that's got to be kept going and uh, for me in particular when i looked at the rental part it was in conjunction with the ministry of finance uh, first you know supports for jobs by 
paying companies the salaries of employees. Second, SMEs employ more than 2 million Singaporeans, or in some way, 2 million Singaporeans are involved with SMEs through their families. And uh, if you look at their lives and their livelihoods and SMEs, apart from the uh, cost of uh, uh, salaries, rental is a big cost. It's up to 25, 30% and they've been forced to shut down. Even when they reopen, it's not going to be easy. So we've said for those in the F&B and retail sector where business has gone down in the F&B sector by about 60, 70%. And in the retail sector, somewhat uh, similar numbers too. Rental relief, four months off for F&B and retail, two months off for the office and industrial sector would come as a big relief for a lot. Now, uh, no one knows how long this is going to last, how long this is going to take. But we will do what it takes to keep the country and economy afloat and help our people. So there is a chance that the government will extend and cover more areas? We will have to see what is necessary. There is no ideology involved in this. It's a question of what works. We will do whatever it takes to make it work. At the peak of the crisis, there were many measures that were passed, understandably, to respond to the situation on the ground. At the same time, uh, that's led to some confusion on the ground and also contributed to the perception that the government was indecisive or even reactive. What's your response to that? I can that? understand that. The first question is, did those measures have to be rolled out? Our assessment after taking the scientific advice, after assessing the need and around the world, yes, we have to do them. And uh, some of them came very quickly. Then we had to communicate. I think by and large, most people understood, but I can also understand that you know some people couldn't follow because they, the communications came at a fairly rapid pace. Uh, that's part and, part and parcel of the sort of challenges of communication. We just have to try and do better. On hindsight, what is the one thing you could have done differently? You know, I've looked at it on the whole when I look at how Singaporeans have reacted and how Singapore has reacted and uh, how other countries are reacting. First of all, in terms of the healthcare, our mortality rates, one of the lowest in the world. We've up to today, 26 people who have unfortunately passed away uh, and about 3,000 odd community cases and of course, much larger number of uh, foreign workers who because of their age generally just pass through it without even having to be hospitalized. On the whole, I think uh, that the healthcare side has been handled very well. Our frontline healthcare workers, our medical system has been superb. They have done an ex excellent job. The uh, economy, again, uh, we moved in very fast and uh, we put the money on the table. We put in a series of relief measures and we looked at, we delayed the closing down as much as possible, even well after other countries. And we, we, now we are in the phase of opening up. Now it's been a few days since we've started phase two. And uh, on the whole, given that you know, nobody knows the nature of this virus, really, everyone is working it through, to compare with the approaches that have been taken elsewhere, I would say our record speaks for itself. Is there room for more public consultation moving forward? You see, a question like this would have to be answered as yes, because there's always room for public consultation. But in what context? When you have to make decisions quickly, you can't be going out for a long public consultation. For example, you know, you've got to decide by tomorrow, uh, whether something has to be done or shouldn't be done. Uh, that limits the time of consultation and really the consultation has to be with people who, are, uh, who have expertise and who can contribute their viewpoints on specific matters. Depending on other matters, when you have the luxury of time, for example, when we put out legislation and uh, then we put it out on the online and ask for general public consultation. So it depends on the amount of time you have and the subject matter. Much, much more to discuss with you, Minister. But first, let's take a quick break.
Welcome back to the special edition of In Conversation. Minister, I would like to talk about social policing, uh, particularly during the circuit breaker period. We saw many pictures and videos going viral online of uh, people who supposedly flout the rules. What do you think of this sort of vigilantism? Social policing itself, in itself, is all right in the sense that you know we have a website. If you feel, if you find that somebody is uh, flouting the rules, you send the pictures there, you file a report, and uh, public help is essential for us to try and maintain the rules, try and make sure that we can enforce the rules. Because our safe distance ambassadors, the police, they can't be everywhere, right? So there is a useful role. However, as with all these things, uh, some people, quite a lot of people, take it to the extreme. They then move on to lynching. Uh, and you know, it's like a, sometimes, it's like a mob attacking you, anonymous, online, putting up your pictures, uh, as saying all sorts of nasty things about you. Sometimes they even get the wrong person. So that can destroy careers, it can ruin mental health, it can seriously damage people. And uh, I think, again, it's a lot of responsibility placed on individuals. Come on, let's be fair. You want to identify somebody to say that so-and-so has been breaching the rules, this person, something is happening somewhere? Yes, that's good. But to go beyond and everyone jumping in to attack the person, even before you identify whether it's the right person, and sometimes, as I said, wrong people have been identified. Sometimes, uh, you know, you overdo it, their family gets attacked, they may lose their jobs as a result, even before they end up in court. I don't think any of us will want to be in that situation. Are you personally aware of any particular case that caught your attention or that aggravated you? A number of cases have happened uh, during this uh, uh, period, during the circuit breaker period, uh, where people, I think, have crossed the line and uh, gone into personal attacks. For example, in the context of the, uh, the famous sovereign lady, uh, a wrong person was identified and attacked and, you know, her position was put out. It's... Uh, very, very hurtful for the individual and the family involved when they've got nothing to do with the matter and somebody puts up their photograph and say they are the one who did this. But uh, in that case, I think the individual who put it up subsequently acknowledged his mistake and therefore the situation didn't get out of hand. But uh, around the world, you see many instances. Thankfully, in Singapore, it's still of, uh, not at that scale, but it's something we need to be very watchful about. I have to tell you that personally, I did make use of the One Service app. At the same time that I used it, I felt deeply troubled by it. Because on the one hand, I had the same thought. The government can't be everywhere. Yes. Maybe there are areas of weakness that they are not aware of. So we're helping to inform. But at the same time, I felt like I was ratting on my compatriots. How do we strike a balance between social policing and, and, and what we should be doing? I think if you use the One Safe app, you can be sure it's the right thing to do. You may be right, you may be wrong. You send it there, the professionals who then look at it, there will be a proper investigation. If the person is innocent, he goes off. If the person is not innocent, some action is taken and you're helping to make society better. Because first of all, that individual will hopefully not repeat it again. Anyway, he's gotten a lesson. Second, if he is charged in court, it's a warning to others. So it's very, very helpful. What is not helpful is to try and create an internet spectacle out of it and attack the individual. How do we ensure that we don't go overboard with this? We have some laws against that, and I think uh, every now and then we'll have to make sure we enforce them so that people are aware that they need to be responsible as well. It's just like, you know, you can't walk up to some individual because they are breaching the law and punch them. You don't take the law into your own hands. And uh, lynching on the internet is uh, not dissimilar. When the infections in the foreign worker dormitory started to rise, Singaporeans started to see insensitive and sometimes even racist remarks against the migrant workers. And then again, when the foreigners were seen socialising at Robertson Quay. Do you think the pandemic has brought out the ugly side of Singaporeans? There is an ugly side to in every country, including Singapore. On the whole, and I've always said this, I think the majority of our people are OK, thankfully. There will always be a minority, whether it's a race or xenophobia, there will always be a minority who then uh, take it to extremes. It's an interesting uh, sequence of events. Uh, 
when COVID-19 first started in China, you had a lot of anti-Chinese sentiments uh, around the world, but even in Singapore, people posting. Uh, we've had people posting, oh, this is a, a retribution of a, you know, a God against the Chinese and so on, uh, which is very bad and totally nonsensical. Uh, second, when the migrant workers, primarily Indians and Bangladeshis, began to be infected in large numbers, then it turned towards Indians. And, uh, you know, in the month of April, for example, we have had more race-related uh, attacks than for many, many, many years. I think the stress of the situation and uh, the economic stress, the physical stress, the pressure in every society has created serious issues. And they find themselves good cause along the fault lines. What are the fault lines in every society? Race, religion, anything that can differentiate one group from another group. And here, race-related incidents shot up in April. And uh, foreigner, anti-foreigner sentiment too. Uh, partly, you know, if you see a number of uh, white people sort of who seem to be openly and flagrantly uh, breaching the law, that makes anyone unhappy. And it's not just white, you know, if you see a bunch of Chinese or Indians or Malays doing it, you'll also be unhappy. Uh, but some people then identify them as whites, separate from Singaporeans, and it brings out the xenophobic tendencies. We've got to deal with it and, you know, apply the law equally, whether you're white, brown, yellow, whatever you are, whatever color, whatever nationality, whether Singaporean, non-Singaporean, the law is the same and it applies equally. And we've got to make clear that and it's, you know, where they claim trial, it goes to court. Where they don't claim trial, MOM has a policy. If you are a foreign person here on a work pass, you are asked to leave. If you are Singaporean, you face the charges. Otherwise, you are warned if the prosecution decides this is not a case to be charged. Apply the law equally, and after a while, people understand. You mentioned that incidents related to race and religion shot up. Can you elaborate? The uh, number of uh, attacks on the internet based on race, the number of uh, verbal spats between uh, the three major ethnic groups, Chinese, Malays, Indians. We track these numbers, and we know that in April, it's much higher than it has been for many years. Is that worrying for you? It's, uh, in a sense, yes, but it's not uh, a surprise. If you go back and look at my speeches for many years, I've always said there are the fault lines. And, uh, but overall, I'm heartened. Because if you look at our society, we are very different from other societies in the way we've approached race and religion. First of all, we have a very tough framework of laws which prevent you from attacking or speaking bad about another race or person of another religion. And I fundamentally believe that that's important and I completely disagree with some people who in the name of, uh, say, freedom of speech will say, oh, we should be allowed to say whatever we like about the Chinese, the Malays, the Indians, and allow a different way of approaching this. No, the way it works out in reality is hate speech increases and anger increases, and that then fuels racism. So we have a very strict framework of laws, and our people have for many years accepted it. Second, we do active promotion of racial harmony. And a number of steps are taken. People live together in HTB estates. We work together. Our police force, army, everything is integrated. The third is, if you look at uh, our trust in institutions, just take trust in the police force. 90% of Singaporeans, more than 90% of Singaporeans, have trust in the police force. That shows you that people accept and internalize a certain compact and framework of society. So on the whole, the glass is 90% full. It's 10% not full. So it's uh, something to be heartened by. The local versus foreigner debate is likely to intensify as the general elections draw closer. Um, what can you do about this? The issue is likely to be politicized because some political parties find advantage over it. But you step back and you look at the facts. First, 
what are our fundamental policies? We have an economy in 762 square kilometers of Singapore. We have an economy the same size as the economy of Malaysia without anything like those resources. And they have a 30 million population. We have, including our foreign worker population, 5 million. How is this possible? Because of the very sound economic policies. How is it that our people enjoy some of the best health care, the best education in the world at highly subsidized rates, 90%, more than 90% housing ownership, good jobs? And if you look at the income increase at every decile, from the lowest to the highest, everyone has increased, and the lower income sectors have increased more in the last few years. That hasn't happened in many places around the world. How is it that we are able to maintain this social compact, make sure that everyone is given e enough opportunities, help all our children? How is all this possible with no resources? Because we, are, we encourage local economy, SMEs, which employ more than 60% of our workforce, but we are also attractive to multinationals. So yes, there are some people who take a xenophobic line Oh, you know, away with the foreigners, we can fill in the jobs. What they don't realize is the multinationals may also leave. They don't have to be here. They are also foreign. And, you know, this is no different from some countries where people say jobs must come back from overseas. Our companies mustn't invest overseas. Our companies must come back. This kind of thinking, the xenophobic thinking, if it pervades around the world, the big MNCs you see in Singapore will be forced to go back. And who loses? The average Singaporean. Would you say that more needs and can be done, especially for the lower income Singaporeans? We are doing a lot and I think we'll have to do more because this pandemic would make it more difficult across the entire economic sector. And obviously, we must do even more to make sure there is a, you know, help given to those who need help. But that's the key. It cannot be help across all sectors, but it must be targeted to the people who need the help. And we got to keep looking at that. But not just the lower income. We have people in their 40s and 50s who now have uh, concerns about their jobs as a result of the pandemic. We need to help them. We need to help them change. We may not be able to save all the jobs, but we have to save every person and try and reskill him and try and find jobs for them. I mean, we are creating, we are talking about 100,000 jobs, you know, in the next couple of years to try and make sure that the graduating students and the people who are older all find some sort of work. But it's a private sector that creates jobs. Private sector, both Singaporean and MNCs. And we've got to make the conditions right for them to employ Singaporeans. We need to take a short break now, but when we come back, I'd like to talk about the first general election that we will go into with Profma in place. Welcome back. Minister, how effective has POFMA been in curbing the spread of disinformation during this period? I would say reasonably effective. Uh, we've had a number of times when we had to use POFMA, I think about 11. In fact, of all the POFMA uh, orders that we received, 50%, half, were due for COVID-related disinformation. You know, disinformation around the world has had very bad consequences about vaccines, about the efficacy of various medication, and people go and take it. In Iran, for example, I think uh, 700 people died, and about 90 people lost their eyesight because of fake information passed out about, oh, you, if you take this medication, it's good for COVID. This is bad. And uh, in Europe, I saw, I think a few days ago, the major media companies came together to say, look, the disinformation on uh, internet platforms is now a pandemic in itself. And uh, something needs to be done. We cannot rely on the goodwill of the internet platforms anymore. You know, governments have to take action. For us, in the first place, it's not a pandemic in terms of fake news. There isn't that much, but we have seen a spike. And uh, when we issue the orders, it's like a health check. You know, people straight away realize, oh, this is fake. And uh, that has, I think, uh, warned off would-be perpetrators of fake news. And it's also helped educate our public. 
how do you keep track of all that avalanche of information? <laughs> Uh, I think we need to uh, sieve through and decide, okay, which one is likely to have an impact. If they say, you know, this MRT station is closed, that's going to have an impact on people. If they say somebody has died here, that's going to have an impact on people. You make an assessment, some rubbish you let go because nobody's going to believe it or it's not going to have a major impact. You've got to decide, is it false and is it in the public interest to deal with? It's not easy, but I think if you see the kind of news environment in Singapore, for COVID-19 and the amount of fake news, it's, we are in a far better situation than other countries. Have you had to increase the manpower on the ground, people who are looking no, through all no, this stuff? No, you know, we, we have not had to increase. Uh, we have a team that looks and uh, looks at you know, the kind of fake news that's coming up, but also people alert us to it. Uh, many people, members of the public, as well as others who look at it and they say, oh, you know, there is this thing going around, is it true? And then it comes up, and the POFMA office looks at it, checks with Ministry of Health, say this is rubbish, should we issue an order? We issue an order. As I said, we have had to do it 11 times, not that many. And uh, overall, the situation is okay. Has POFMA allowed the government to react quickly enough, for example, to stave off panic buying and hoarding? We haven't had to use POFMA in that context. There was some panic buying, but uh, that wasn't based on uh, sort of falsehoods as such, that was based on Fear and panic, uh, based on some rumours, yes, but uh, I think government countered it by setting out the true factual situation and making sure the products are available. After a few days, the situation stabilised. We have seen similar panic buying elsewhere, but uh, POFMA didn't have to specifically be used in that context. Okay, let's talk about uh, the upcoming elections. Yes. Uh, the upcoming general elections with the first one with POFMA in place. What do you say to people who feel that POFMA is disadvantaging the opposition? Now, I don't understand that because uh, for two reasons at least. One, the POFMA orders require you to put up a health warning that what you have said is untrue. So it doesn't disadvantage you. You put it up, let readers judge. If you have said the truth and uh, there is a notice there saying this is untrue, it will also say for the truth, go to such and such a place. People read what you have written, people read what the government says, and they decide for themselves. So this actually encourages greater democracy because it encourages more information. You can argue censorship only if your article is taken down, but your article is there. So what are you embarrassed about? No, what they are really arguing is they need to be able to put out all these untruths. For example, that Tamasic is losing money, which you know Brad Boyer said, and it's total falsehood. So he was embarrassed because he had to carry a health check, which says this is untrue. So they don't want that. They want to be able to say untrue things, make people angry without being uh, pointed out. They don't like being exposed. So if that is wrong, then these... Uh, people should ask themselves, why do they need to deal in lies? The second point on this is that they have a right to challenge. And uh, really, we need to encourage people to argue based on policies, on facts. You can be as hard as you like on the government policies, on the government, in your viewpoints. You can offer counter policies. POFMA cannot apply to any of that. It's only when you say that uh, you know, uh, specific facts are not true, or you put out lies, then you are required to carry a health warning. I don't see that as an issue. You have explained your position before. There are still people who persist in thinking that way. Do you think, do you fear rather a voter backlash? Because they say that, well, if this is what the government has to do, then I just won't vote for you. Name me a policy in any country, including Singapore, where 100% of the people will agree with you. It's your sense, first of all, the government has got to do what it believes is right. And second, I believe the majority of people understand what we say. And of those who disagree, I think there are different categories. There are some who genuinely don't know enough and are therefore concerned, and that's a small minority. And there are some who know full well, but are cynical and cynically trying to put out further lies about POFMA. So I think, by and large, the voters know that now that POFMA has been in operation for a while and the orders have been made, they've seen how they operate, they see that you know, the original articles are up there, 
SDP was uh, issued with a POFMA order. SDP's original article is still there. You read that and you read the counter and you decide for yourself. Or Brad Boyer, you know, his article is still there. Or, you know, the uh, falsehoods on COVID are still there. And then there is uh, the counter and the people can read for themselves. I think most, many people realize that. I don't see an issue on this. But individuals like me, I'm not a legal expert. So during the, uh, the campaign period, for example, uh, what should I do? What happens if I forward some content which I did not know was untrue? Will that get me into trouble? No, uh, if you didn't know that it was untrue and you forwarded it, well, you know, it just means that sometimes you might be issued with an order saying, hey, if you have a website, for example, carry a health check saying this information is untrue, that's all. But by and large, the people who forward would not be the people who would have to carry that unless they have, as I say, websites and so on. The originator of the information is the person that will have to think seriously about this. My eldest is a teenager, and I want him to pay attention to uh, the upcoming elections because I want him to be involved in the entire electoral process so that he has a stake uh, and ownership over the results. How do we ensure, and for, to do that, we need to have a lively political debate. How can we ensure that? We should get our people to understand the issues, and uh, that is difficult in any country because very often what takes the public imagination are sound bites and the immediate. We need them, we need your teenager to understand the issues today, but also the issues that are going to face in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Singapore, Singapore's economy, Singapore's future, his or her future, what lies in store? What are the factors? What are the fundamentals? How do we make a living? How do we ensure our security? Who is best going to be able to do that? What is the structure in parliament and politics that's going to help that? These are the issues that your teenager child will have to focus on. Read what is in the media. Read what is uh, online, but form your own views, because often it is uh, you know, skewed or untrue, plain untrue. Listen to the speeches carefully. Don't get taken by rhetoric. Go deeper. Try and understand. Much, much more to discuss with you, Minister. But first, let's take a quick break. Welcome back to the program. We are still with Minister for Law and Home Affairs, K. Shabugam, and we want to talk about how Singapore can emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the government is working with some NGOs to manage the foreign worker dormitory situation. Do you see a larger role for civil society moving forward? You know, people don't realise how large a role civil society plays in Singapore in many areas. Because if you look at the government's philosophy, there are many things government does but there are things that people can do outside. People are philanthropic, people are generous, most people are, and they want to be able to contribute their time, their money, and uh, they want to be able to do things. A good government, good governance means engaging people, tapping onto this positive energy and channeling it into the ways in which the people want to do so and giving them a framework, whether it is the Lions Home for the Elders or you know, many, many, many other areas. You see religious institutions, you see uh, non-religious institutions, they all want to do something. Cost is high, government comes in with the money, sometimes up to 90% of the capital cost, but they put in some 10%, 5%. They run the thing, the volunteers, their passion would be far better than if government were to run it in an institutionalized way. So in many aspects of our lives, civil society plays a significant role. Specific to migrant workers, Many of the things that had to be done could not have been done by a civil society, which is, uh, you know, can never be as organized as, say, the joint task force of the government. Because we've got the people, we know what the issues are. You've got to go in, you've got to desegregate the workers, you've got to put some of them in community facilities, which had to be built up uh, within a matter of days. You've got to provide health care to those who need health care. You've got to separate them out into those who are well, those who are infected, those who are, you know, you're not quite sure. 
a whole variety of things which cannot be done except by government. You know, that's probably about 80, 90 percent of the work that needs to be done. And uh, usually it's not well known what exactly needs to be done, so, you know, it's not talked about very much. But there is a role for civil society as well, and civil society has played a big role. Many NGOs, in front, for example, the group of NGOs under COVID-19, you know, Migrant Workers uh, Center and others have come together. They provide uh, assistance, they provide uh, some counseling support, some of them provide meals. The government has underwritten all meals for the uh, migrant workers, three meals a day. Uh, since the lockdown and work stopped, we thought it wasn't fair to ask the employers to pay. So the government has underwritten all of that uh, in the public dorms. But nevertheless, they can always do with additional assistance, reaching out, and uh, the NGOs have been very good. And when a government approaches it in a systemic way, and you are dealing with the hundreds of thousands of such persons, there will always be gaps. There will always be differentials in the way that help reaches everyone. And uh, you need people from the ground up to also identify those gaps, come back to the government sometimes, do something themselves. So it's a multi-party effort. Would you say that the way forward, the key word is collaboration? It's always been and it will be so. Are there areas that you think are most suited for the civil society to lead rather than the government? I think there are several areas in which, because government doesn't have all the expertise in itself. You know, government cannot think that it has all the expertise. There will be areas where people outside also have a lot of expertise. And uh, we have recognized that, which is why when we want to study some economic policies or future economy, there is leadership by the private sector in the sense that they come forward and join the various committees that are set up and give their ideas. That's one way. The other is we see what they're doing elsewhere in their own organizations or how the rest of the world is progressing and which ideas can be taken. And there is no shape in copying good ideas. We copy. So, you know, you've got to go on the basis that there are many, many good ideas outside. Some are in the Singapore private sector, some are outside. You've got to be able to absorb them. You've got to use the right people in different contexts and move forward. Phase three will remain until a vaccine is found. When it's found, will the government make it mandatory for Singaporeans to take it? It's too far away for me to express a clear view on that. But vaccines are necessary to inoculate the whole of the population. And I think uh, in Singapore, most people understand that. In some other countries, the question of vaccines has been bedeviled by a lot of false information about the nature of vaccines and what it does to you and so on. And as a result, unfortunately, lives have been lost. But we have vaccinated against a myriad of diseases. Our population, our young people have been vaccinated, children have been vaccinated, and there hasn't been an issue, much of an issue so far. What would be the considerations? I think the consideration has to be protection or safety of society, safety of individuals. I see a strong case for requiring everyone to be vaccinated. The science must support it. And if so, I see a strong case, but this is something that has to be decided when the vaccine is found. You are one of the longest serving members of parliament. You've been through SARS, you've fought the battle of the Asian financial crisis. Has this been your most challenging event to date? I would say yes, both in terms of the health uh, issues. Uh, SARS was a serious health issue. It was more deadly, but less transmissive. But uh, it lasted a much shorter period. This has already lasted a, for a longer period. And uh, we don't see an end in sight until a vaccine comes, which is going to be some several months away, you know, next year sometime, not earlier, unless somebody strikes it very lucky. So it's been tough and it's, uh, it's been devastating on the economy, not just in Singapore, but across the world. Uh, the key is to get through this, keep our social cohesion, because social cohesion in many countries has suffered badly. Help the people who are most vulnerable, but help across the sectors, particularly the middle class and the smaller and medium enterprises, 
save the jobs, try and get through. But when the rebound comes, we have to be among the fastest to rebound and take advantage of the new opportunities. This pandemic has also meant that very many different ways of doing businesses. And many of those changes which were already in the making have been accelerated. We need to jump on those, institutionalize them, incorporate them, move on that so that when the rebound comes, these processes, these approaches, approaches of mine all are in there. And the government gives a hefty push and support for that so that Singapore again, you know, as has been in the past, jumps the fastest. You've said that the last, the last few months have been particularly tough. How have you taken it personally? It's just meant that, you know, you, you are like on a roller coaster which doesn't stop. And uh, it's got to be done, you just do it. What has been the most difficult challenge then? The uh, series of decisions that had to be made at the Ministerial Task Force with uh, limited information and a very dynamic and changing situation and uh, different types of signs and evidence coming forward. Uh, do you do this uh, or do you do that? And, uh, and also balancing the different factors and week to week being prepared to change your mind if necessary when new evidence comes forward and trying to make sure that people on the whole are protected, uh, both from the health issues and the economic issues. And then finally having to do the circuit breaker and the impact on the economy and then seeing what can be done for example, we put through legislation to help SMEs, rental relief and so on, and also a moratorium for them to pay the rentals, which was significant, um, four budgets by the Ministry of Finance. So a lot on both sides. Has dealing with the crisis taught you anything new as a leader? To be very humble, because there are always many challenges, and uh, it, many of them are will be new and unexpected, and you can never uh, lose your guard or put, like, put down your guard. It's to do this job, not just my job, but I think across the sector, whether you are an economic leader outside or any other ministry, anywhere, we see that the world is going through many different challenges, and so is Singapore. And we, we need to be constantly alert. But I'll say this to Singaporeans. We are an exceptional country, and I believe we will remain exceptional. Thank you very much for your time, Minister. Thank you.